Hey everyone, we're nearly ready to go. Uh, welcome to the few other people who've just joined us. We'll give everyone the last couple of minutes. Um, I'm just finalising the preparation to go Facebook online, uh, on Facebook Live, and then we will start. To those who have just joined, um, you can either ask questions via the chat box or via the Q&A function. Um, either will notify me that there are questions to be asked. We have got a few that were submitted in advance as well that I will make sure to ask. Um, to access the chat or the Q&A, you need to go to the bottom of your screen and there should be the two options that you can click on there. Um, any issues, please let us know in the chat box and we will try to help you as best we can from far away. And we are also live on Facebook now. Right. Okay, so it's 10.15, so I think we'll, we'll get started with the, the webinar. Thank you everyone for, for joining in um, and the attendees. We've got a lovely turnout there. Um, Dr. Patel, are you there? <laughs> Just waiting for him to, to switch. Yes, I am, yes. Wonderful, thank Hi. you. <laughs> Just wanted to check you were there before I started rambling. Uh, so welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, we have tried to put this out as quick as we can, given um, that the coronavirus pandemic has sort of uh, come out of nowhere for everyone. Um, but we thought it was really important to get as much information as we could out there for our patients and webinars uh, seemed a sensible option for this. So thank you for joining us. Um, as I said um, in the uh, before we started, if you would like to ask a question, please do so using the Q&A function or the chat function um, at the bottom of your screen. And I just also wanted to mention that the advice that we'll be given today or any information will be given is UK specific. So if anybody is not from the UK, please do not take this information as, um, as relevant for your countries. Unfortunately, we're not able to give international advice. Before we start, I just wanted to introduce everyone. So we've got um, Kate, who is uh, an APL patient and a trustee of Leukemia Care. And she's very kindly um, joined us as a panelist to uh, give sort of the patient, overall patient perspective on the current situation. And also, of course, we've got Dr. Armit Patel from the Christie in Manchester. Thank you for your time, Armit. Um, so I'll kick off with a quick overview of um, the general government guidance and other bits and bobs. I just need to share the screen very quickly. Let's just begin that slideshow. Okay, so hopefully everyone should be able to see the slides now. Please shout up if not. So the general government guidance that was provided for the coronavirus pandemic is that anyone with people, any person with a cancer of the blood or the bone marrow, such as leukemia, lymphoma or myeloma, who are at any stage of treatment should be what is known as shielding. I think some confusion may have come from the concept of shielding. Um, this is a, sort of a, a term that has been made up for the coronavirus pandemic, but this refers to um, staying at home uh, it sort of uh, avoiding contact with any people, whereas um, another term that's been used uh, since the pandemic has come along is social distancing, which is where you should avoid as much contact of po as possible with other people, but not necessary, necessarily all contact with people. So the main difference there is 
Um, I'll come back to that in a moment, actually. Um, so when the government put this guidance out, we were made aware that they were taking a cautious approach into who should be shielding um, during the coronavirus pandemic. And therefore we took this to mean that anybody with leukemia um, or any other blood cancer diagnosis should be shielding. However, since then it's become apparent that there are variations between blood cancer types, types of treatment, um, time since being treated, for example, those in long-term remission. And therefore this webinar should hopefully clarify some of this guidance for, for everyone um, living with acute leukemias today. So some of this extra guidance we've been made aware of from haematologists and other experts in the area is um, that if you are in a continuing remission um, following intensive therapy, um, but you are still on immune, so that you are not on immunosuppressive therapies, and you are more than one year out of treatment, you are unlikely to need to shield. Additionally, there may be some potential variation between those who have um, had uh, allogeneic or autologous stem cell transplants. Um, and I'm sure Armit will, will come back to that later. Um, and there is also some confusion as to whether people are experiencing uh, chronic graft versus host disease or GVHD, whether they should be shielding as well. Um, our advice has been that if you are not sure if you should, should be shielding um, and if you have not received a letter, it's your clinical team who should be advising you as to your own personal risk. Although I'm sure Armit will, will come back to, to this later and be able to clarify slightly more for us. But what does shielding actually mean? As I said, there, there has been some confusion between social distancing, which is what the general public are being advised to do, and the process of shielding. Shielding is the advice not to leave the home, and this includes even for exercise. Um, you may have been aware there's been some controversy around um, the general public being able to go out and, and use the, the, pub, the parks and the public spaces. Um, but for those who are shielding, it's not advised that you take exercise anywhere where you may come into contact with other people. The only exception to this is for appointments that your doctors have recommended that you still need to have. Um, this shielding guidance becomes more complicated if you live with other people um, who are still wanting to leave the house. Now, the advice from the government on this is if the other people in your household still need to leave the house, you must social distance from yourself, social distance themselves from you within your home. And this means remain two metres apart from them at all times, sleep separately and use shared utensils and spaces at different times with full cleaning in between. Um, we appreciate that's not easy for everyone. And if you're if you want information on that specifically, I'd urge you to get in touch with Leukemia Care, but we'll come back to that at the end. But what if you don't have a letter? So the NHS has been sending out letters to confirm whether you are vulnerable in this shielding group, but we are aware there have been teething issues with this, which is not unexpected given the speed and the scale of the project. Um, it's important to remember that you can still register for support. Now, England have a central system um, and we will share the link uh, on various places in our social media and I'm sure um, those monitoring our Facebook Live will be able to share this link with you. Um, and it should also be in your letter. The central system is, is important um, because even if you haven't had a letter, you can still register and let the, the government know what sort of support you need. It's also important to note that local councils actually have their own schemes in place to support patients um, and also have uh, a lot of them have dedicated helplines for those who need support. So um, it's always worth trying them as well if you haven't received your letter yet. Unfortunately, the situation is less clear in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, the advice is to contact your local council if you need support while you wait for your letter. In terms of obtaining a letter, as well as obtaining support, um, you should contact your GP in the first instance and your haematologist after that. Um, different trusts are, are making decisions as to who gets a letter in, in slightly different ways. Um, so hopefully one of those two people will be able to uh, assist you in finding a letter. And that's the information from NHS England. 
In terms of treatment changes, I'll let Armit explain most of this um, as this is his area of expertise, but our understanding of the situation as a whole is that doctors are being asked to make risk benefit decisions for each individual patient. So you should be advised whether your treatment or your appointment is necessary based on your individual circumstances and what you need at that time. It's also important to note that the NHS have told us that urgent cancer treatment is still a priority. So there's no general guidance that, that has asked uh, hospitals to stop treating cancer patients. That's really important to a message to get out there. In terms of general guidance for doctors, um, the NHS and NICE have distributed advice to doctors on how to make those risk benefit decisions. And also specialist groups are adding to this, which I know um, Armit will touch on in, in a bit, but um, two important bodies, uh, the NCRI AML Working Party, which is a group of AML clinicians, and the EBMT, um, that's Bone Marrow Transplant European Level Group, are also providing advice to clinicians. So I just wanted to highlight that, again, the urgent cancer treatment is still going ahead. But if you do not understand why a decision has been made one way or another for you, um, please speak to your doctors and they should be able to under, uh, explain why a decision has been made on your behalf. So I think now is important to pass over to uh, Armit. Uh, he will be able to explain a bit more detail from his perspective um, on shielding and who should be shielding and also what you can expect in terms of treatment changes at this current time. So let me pass over control to Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, I suppose the, um, if I just uh, advance, have you passed over control to me, Charlotte? There we go. Okay. <clears throat> and then slideshow. OK, fine. So um, I'm going to spend a, the next couple of minutes talking a bit about uh, uh, leukemia, particularly acute leukemia, and uh, sometime talking about transplantation uh, and CAR T cell therapy. Uh, but as Charlotte's pointed out, I think the, the most important thing to do is if you haven't received a letter um, saying that you're in a vulnerable group, uh, at least in England, you can register uh, online and uh, get access to food parcels and other support. Um, I, th I, think, I think the arrangements are slightly uh, less developed in other parts of the country um, where councils are, are leading on this, but the link is there to, uh, to self-register. Um, I think that the important thing to say about COVID-19 in patients with blood cancers is actually we know very little um, globally about this. Um, there were, in, in, in the patients that have had uh, more of a severe illness, there's not been an excess representation of patients with blood cancers or patients who have had a transplant or CAR T cell therapy, perhaps because the numbers are very small, but also because uh, I suspect a lot of patients are um, already practicing some form of social distancing, which is what we advise and have always advised our patients to practice. Um, and uh, I've just presented the numbers here from America, and you can see that uh, all types of blood cancers are uh, affected, including patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia or acute myeloid leukemia. Um, and you can see all types of disease severity are also represented as well. Um, I think that if if you develop any symptoms that you worried about uh, in terms of COVID-19, I think the first thing to do is just make sure that you speak to your transplant center or your leukemia center um, in the first instance. Um, and, and then they will direct you to whether you do need to, to discuss this with uh, NHS 111. You'll, you'll, provide, you'll get the best advice, I think, from your, your own center. It's important to remember though, um, that if you do have fever, we always use that as a marker of infection. And it's very important to um, not forget that patients who have fever with leukemia or, or having a transplant or CAR T cell therapy, um, uh, those patients are 
just as likely to continue to have fever because of infection, bacterial infection and otherwise, uh, would therefore be uh, advised to contact their hospital and go to seek medical advice as normal. I think if COVID-19 is then suspected at a later date, the hospitals have all got their own uh, policies and procedures or about isolation in, in that regard. <clears throat> If we remember that, although the government advice is uh, in relation to cough and fever, um, the number of symptoms, and this is a short list that, that we're continually adding to, uh, that are uh, found in patients with COVID-19 are quite uh, large, and they include uh, fatigue, breathlessness in particular, uh, as well as uh, shortness of breath, sputum production, chills, uh, and so on. But patients who end up having symptoms of a sore throat or a headache uh, or nasal congestion, these patients can also have COVID-19 as well. So it's, it's very important to, to get advice from uh, your, your hematologist. In terms of acute leukemia, I think um, following on from what Charlotte said, um, all patients would uh, be included in the uh, category for not just self-isolation, but for shielding. Um, and and uh, we can talk a bit about uh, what that means for patients in long-term remission um, and, and, and issues like that in the Q&A. But I think in, in general, this applies to every patient who has uh, acute leukemia and is receiving some form of treatment or has recently received from some form of treatment. Um, for newly diagnosed patients, the recommendation is to uh, screen for COVID-19, and most centers are now able to do this uh, as the number of tests available to uh, the hospitals has increased. And also most patients uh, would be recommended to be um, nursed uh, with uh, a single room if available. And again, this is gonna be difficult in some centers, but this is what's recommended. Patients that are partway through treatment uh, will find that um, their treatment may be delayed or uh, subsequent consolidation cycles are uh, either de uh, delayed or omitted based on, uh, patient, based on molecular monitoring. Um, and patients who have no detectable disease, for example, after some treatment may then have a, a gap uh, or uh, just be monitored in the interim rather than being put at increased risk of uh, developing uh, severe manifestations of COVID-19 uh, with, with chemotherapy. Patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, who have completed the induction phases of chemotherapy are likely to continue on some form of maintenance therapy. Um, and patients who either have newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia or those who have um, uh, relapsed disease may, may be offered non-chemotherapy-based, more outpatient-based therapy, uh, including with emerging drugs, which actually aren't yet available in the NHS, but are now being accessed by some centers, um, uh, drugs such as venetoclax. Um, patients with good risk disease may have a cycle omitted and just be monitored, uh, as, as I mentioned. And I think um, uh, patients who have relapsed or refractory disease may then be offered again emerging treatments uh, that are targeted, which allow the patient to uh, spend more time out of hospital where the risk of catching COVID-19 will be lower um, as long as self-isolation and shielding is practiced. Um, Charlotte mentioned a number of guidelines have been developed very rapidly. The NICE guideline for stem cell transplantation is highlighted here. Um, and I think this, this applies to patients with CAR T-cell therapy as well, although no specific recommendation for this patient group has been made yet. Um, and a number of points from this are important to highlight. I think one is that uh, patients who don't know uh, they have COVID-19 prior to a transplant or a CAR T cell um, therapy being scheduled, those patients should uh, self-isolate and shield for more than two weeks prior to the planned procedure. Um, and then they will then be tested for respiratory viruses, including COVID-19, at least three days before starting the conditioning chemotherapy for either the CAR T cell therapy or the, the transplant procedure. Um, for patients who have suspected or known uh, disease, they will be tested for the usual viruses, including COVID-19. And uh, if the COVID-19 test is positive, the transplant will be delayed for three or more months 
um, which is the uh, recommendation made. Now, for some patients, that may not be possible because of the very high risk of disease progression uh, or uh, adverse if effects of, of a delay, in which case the transplant, uh, and I've added in italics, because again, it's not uh, within the recommendation, um, patients can proceed to transplant if their symptoms have resolved and they've had three repeated tests negative at least one week apart. So effectively, what this means is the, the transplant will be delayed probably three weeks, two to three weeks um, uh, at least. Um, and, and I suppose the reason for that um, uh, two to three week time window is because uh, patients will uh, continue shedding for that period of time. And so if somebody isn't scheduled for their transplant, but is scheduled to have a transplant related procedure, so that may be collecting their own stem cells if they're having an autologous stem cell transplant, um, or uh, collecting their own lymphocytes if they're having CAR T cell therapy. Um, if those patients come into close contact with anyone who's uh, got COVID-19, then that procedure itself needs to be delayed for a minimum of two, but preferably three weeks. If we uh, then look at uh, the whole spectrum of uh, disease manifestations patients can get, we know that up to a third of patients uh, will develop no symptoms, be contagious for about two weeks, um, hopefully develop some form of immunity. Um, but during that time, we know that they can pass on the virus. Uh, and that's why patients who are having procedures that come into contact with somebody else should follow the, the government advice. In terms of patients who have had their transplant or had their CAR T cell therapy, um, uh, the, the, the advice is to make sure that uh, when somebody's admitted, uh, there is strict protective isolation and, and all centers are doing that. Um, in the uh, guidance, if you've had a uh, autologous stem cell transplant, then you should be shielding, uh, as Charlotte's advised, uh, for a year. And I've added CAR T cell therapy as well, because that's probably what the guidance will be when it's uh, made available. Um, if you've had an allogeneic stem cell transplant, you should be shielding for two years. Um, in the guideline that the government has um, provided, there is a little bit of ambiguity. On the one hand, it says that uh, patients who are in any phase of their treatment should be shielded. And then subsequently, it says patients who are within six months of a transplant or um, uh, patient, and uh, patients who have discontinued their immune suppression should be shielded. So the, the guidance um, that NICE have issued has said two years to make that very, to make that very straightforward. And patients who have had a, an allogeneic transplant more than two years ago, but are still on immune suppressive therapy, have some form of graft versus host disease, or have uh, evidence of immune deficiency, either because of low blood counts or requiring intravenous immunoglobulin replacement therapy, or, or because um, uh, somebody in the transplant center has said that you should uh, be treating yourself as a vulnerable group and self-isolating with shielding, uh, then, then those patients should also uh, follow that advice. Um, in terms of transplant centers and CAR T cell centers, we've had to change the way we're working and change the way we, we can deliver care. Um, and one of the things we've had to do is restrict visitors for inpatients and uh, for patients attending clinic. Uh, we've deferred lots of clinic appointments or substituted these with video or telephone uh, consultations. We've had to defer almost all transplant procedures unless they are very, very urgent. Um, and we, we've, we've also had to defer patients who have got other significant medical comorbidities uh, as well. Um, and I'll come on to why that is in a moment. Um, the other thing we've been asked to do is for patients who are uh, coming up to having an allogeneic stem cell transplant, we have had to make sure that the donor stem cells have been harvested frozen and transported to us and are available on site before we start treatment, just in case the donor uh, unfortunately it develops COVID-19 and has to drop out at the last minute. Now in terms of comorbidities, uh, the reason that recommendation is made is because uh, information from other countries uh, has indicated that um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, respiratory disease, 
hypertension specifically, um, all, all, all of these other chronic uh, medical problems do increase the risk of um, a worse manifestation from COVID-19. And you can see cancer is represented there, but um, you can see it's less important than all of these other uh, medical problems. <clears throat> in, in terms of the UK, what we absolutely want to avoid is the risk of patients with leukemia or um, patients that have had a transplant or CAR T cell therapy requiring an intensive care unit admission. Because we know that in the general population, uh, the number of patients that are admitted to intensive care, um, unfortunately, tend not to have a good outcome um, with their COVID-19. And what we don't want to do is have patients in uh, the groups I've mentioned, uh, which will um, have an increased risk of a poor outcome being, being put at risk. And that's why a lot of treatment has been uh, delayed or deferred. Uh, so in terms of clinic visits, uh, and I did a clinic uh, yesterday, we're advising that uh, patients ideally attend alone, but if a carer is required, and we recognize sometimes this is necessary, then uh, that's restricted to one person. Uh, we want to make sure that the, the time waiting in the waiting area is minimized. So uh, uh, we're trying to review the way we're scheduling patients, encouraging patients to not arrive early, and perhaps asking patients to wait in their car or outside the hospital if possible, and then, and then contact it to, to come into the uh, clinic area uh, when it's uh, appropriate. And actually, we're learning to utilize uh, telemedicine and video conferencing uh, much more readily. Um, and, you know, there, there are pros and cons with, with doing this. Um, one of the problems has been uh, making sure patients get medicines that they need. And hospitals are developing ways of managing this. So uh, we're beginning to try and post medicines out to patients uh, and use some of the uh, um, thousands of NHS volunteers that have come on board to help with, with this effort. Um, we're also trying to coordinate blood tests and, and perhaps make this um, separate from the clinic consultation. So uh, essentially patients can do a blood drop either locally if their GP set up to do it, but if not, um, then they can of course come to their transplant or car centre to do the drop at a, a time where it's quiet. And I think the, the last uh, slide I wanted to show was this um, uh, slide about uh, staying at home. And I think really all of us, um, uh, particularly patients um, who have leukemia or who've had some form of cell therapy, should be uh, self-isolating. And, and patients uh, who fulfill the criteria for shielding should be shielding, as, um, as Charlotte's advised. The number of... Uh, uh, organizations that have provided guidance is, is quite large. I've listed some of these here. Um, and uh, I think that the, the guidance is in its infancy. It's, it's being developed as new patient information is becoming available. Uh, and I think it will be adapted and changed um, in the next uh, few weeks. So I'm going to stop there um, and uh, hand over to Kate. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Kate. I'm just going to give you a brief um, chat about my situation. Um, so I was diagnosed with APL, which is acute promyelocytic leukemia in September 2016. Um, after three rounds of chemo, things looked to be good. And then I relapsed and it came back again with a vengeance. And so after arsenic treatment and um, cranial radiotherapy. I then had an auto stem cell transplant in September 2017, which included high dose chemo and total body radiation. Uh, things didn't quite go to plan after that, so it took a long while for me to recover from that. Um, but now, thankfully, I'm in remission. So that was sort of two and a half years ago when I actually had the transplant. And I am on the extremely vulnerable list. I've received the letter um, and the text. So I actually had the text message on the 23rd of March and then the letter a few days later. Um, so 
really I just want to talk a little bit about that and how I've sort of coped with that. So at the moment um, I'm staying at home as per the, ex the guidance. Um, I live on my own um, and I'm relying on friends to drop off food. For me, I was surprised to be on the extremely vulnerable list because I thought, well, I'm in remission. It's been quite a while since I've actually had treatment as such. Um, but the only thing I can think is that I'm on the list because I'm still being closely monitored. So I'm having bone marrow biopsies every three months. Um, my immune system has taken a big hit from the transplant and all of the treatment. So there's still ongoing issues there. Um, so yeah, so I wonder if that's why I'm on the list. Also, I'm waiting to have um, heart scans because of uh, side effects from the treatment. So perhaps that's why I'm on the list. But as per the guidance, I think I'm just going to take it very seriously and stay at home for 12 weeks. Um, I'm quite lucky that I have a garden that I can go into and that's good just to get some fresh air I'm trying to exercise at home but it is worrying um, and I'm especially worried actually for the friends that I'm asking to bring me food because you think you know you don't want to put them at risk for actually having to go out and buy it so yeah there's a lot of um, anxiety around this and I think for me as cancer patients um especially for the acute leukemia patients like myself you know we spent a long time in isolation um during treatments i know i spent many many weeks in hospitals at various times um isolating so in an isolation room or on a ward or having to spend time at home after the transplant so i think i'm used to to that notion it's just a scary prospect that actually the whole country is doing it a lot of the world is doing it and you know this is a threat that we're not entirely sure how it would how we would cope with it if we got it and um, so I think there's a lot of anxiety around that and also the fact that okay well what about treatment going forward so I can only speak for myself but um, my latest bone marrow biopsy um, I presume is going to be cancelled I haven't yet heard um, so that's quite worrying because you think, well, OK, uh, what does that mean for me? Um, also, my clinic appointments have all gone on by a telephone, which is great. So my appointments haven't been cancelled. It's just a telephone consultation rather than going into the hospital. So, again, I haven't heard about my other scans that are due. I imagine they'll all be postponed. So, yeah, that is a, it, it is a concern, I think. For me, not having active treatment in terms of chemotherapy and blood transfusions, um, you know, if I was having that right now, I would be extremely concerned and I can totally understand why people would be worried about going into hospitals um, and also kind of accessing their treatment and concerns about that. I mean, as Amit and Charlotte have both said, the best thing to do is contact your team, your care team. And that's what I would be doing if I was in the same situation. Um, in terms of how I feel this has potentially affected the cancer community, I think there's a lot of concern over who is on the extremely vulnerable list. Um, I know certain friends of mine who have had stem cell transplants slightly um, previous to mine are not on the list or that at least they haven't received a letter so there's some kind of confusion as to who's on the list and why um why people aren't and why people are um i know that for patients in england you can actually go onto the government website and apply for help if you need help with with food and medication um again i found for myself, um, I've relied on friends. I have received one government food parcel, um, which was unexpected, but but amazing. Really, really grateful for that. Excellent. Um, and also I've had to rely on friends to go to a pharmacy and collect medication for me. I feel like some of the, the measures that, say, for instance, supermarkets are putting into practice isn't quite working yet. So 
I know people on the list should be able to to get delivery slots. I haven't been able to on any supermarkets and a lot of them have actually stopped registration for new customers. So I found that quite challenging. Um, so I think there's a lot of concern of, around that. And also um, I'm starting to think about this as well. And, other, and I know other people are too, especially one of the, the comments on the chat here is well, what happens after this 12 weeks, you know, how are we going to integrate back in to normal life so to speak and I guess at the moment nobody's really sure of that right now um, and I'm hoping that more government guidelines or NHS guidelines will be made apparent over the coming weeks. Uh, I just think the majority of people in the country are doing the right thing and staying at home when they can just to stop the spread um, and that is certainly what I will be doing so yeah thank you thank you Kate that was really helpful in terms of putting everything we've advised into the context of you know individuals sat at home probably worrying about these things so that was really helpful thank you um particularly interesting what you say about um transplant patients being used to isolation I wonder if you could just say very briefly whether you feel that that's made it harder or or easier to to experience this particular um period of isolation yeah so I know when I first got the letter or the text even I did sort of my immediate reaction was oh, horror you know and I thought I don't want to have to do this again but actually when I when I calmed down and, and thought about it rationally I thought well come on you're you're a bit of an expert on the um, self-isolation here <laughs> so you've done it to the extreme uh, and you know you can get through it and this time you know I'm not having to do it feeling so so ill yeah. um so yes I think that actually I know I can do it I know I can and I've got mechanisms coping mechanisms already in place you know mentally to to, to deal with this um so I think yes it's going to be hard but there's there's people going through a lot worse and you've just got to bear in mind that by doing this you're not only protecting yourself but you're protecting others and yeah. also the NHS um so I just think that is what's going to get a lot of us through certainly that's what's getting me through um yes it does bring back sort of some traumatic kind of memories from that time but I'm just trying to flip those and use it as a bit of a a push to get through it and think come on you can do this okay so we'll move on to some questions um, we've had a lot of questions come in from the Facebook live as well um, I will say just because of the sheer number of questions in time I'll, I'm going to focus on things that haven't already been covered by Armit um, I think a lot of people are asking um, whether they, how long in remission um, they they should when who should be shielding based on how long they've been in remission but I think Amit has largely answered those questions unless you wanted to add anything at all Amit to, to that but I think you have sort of made that clear in your presentation anything you wanted to add to those questions no I, I think the, the list um, for patients um, post auto transplant uh, or CAR T cell therapy is a year post allotransplant is two years or longer if um, immune suppression, GVHD, inadequate count recovery or, or other reasons um, dictate that then those patients should continue to be shielded. Um, in terms of acute leukemia, if you're receiving any treatment at all, and I think that includes monitoring as well, then you should be shielding. And, and if you haven't received a letter, then, then um, the government website is, is definitely worth visiting, at least if you live in England. Uh, we've had quite a few questions around the guidance um, shielding and the ability to go out for exercise and uh, obviously in my presentation I said that the, the, the guidance for everyone else who is not in the extremely vulnerable list is you can go out for exercise and the advice for people who are shielding is you can't. Um, um, are you able to explain the, uh, what you think the reasoning behind you know people shielding not being able to go out for exercise is? I, and people are there is one question in particular about a concern about losing their fitness um, because they're not able to go out to exercise anymore. Are you able to give any advice for those people? So um, the, the isolation really is to make sure that the, the virus spread is slowed down and um, exercise is allowed in that because it's not felt that those individuals, that's all of us, 
um, are at increased risk should we develop the infection. So in other words, that, that really is for um, other people, the, the um, self-isolation advice. The shielding is to protect the individual that is being shielded. So um, you don't want to, at any cost, get exposed to COVID-19. Um, and, and that means, unfortunately, um, avoiding exercise, which does carry a risk of catching the infection. Um, so although we're, we're saying that um, for the general public, you can go out and exercise, that doesn't mean that the risk of the catching uh, infection is eliminated. It's, it's just reduced and it, re it reduces, it delays the transmission between that individual and another person. It doesn't necessarily protect them. Um, so that's why shielding is, is very important uh, and quite different to the isolation. Shielding is just for your own protection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question here about anxiety over, over relapsing during this time. Um, our advice is you, you, if you are concerned about any symptoms, your, your usual clinical team are the best place to go to, to speak to them. And we are still encouraging people to, to raise these things at the clinical teams, even if not every, even if the whole team isn't available, there should still be someone in your clinical team available to answer your questions. Um, do, you, do you echo that advice, Armit? Would you have anything else to say about to people who are worried about relapsing during this time? I mean, I think um, the, the, the hematology community has thought uh, quite long and hard about this um, dilemma. Um, patients who haven't initiated treatment uh, with acute leukemia um, are, are, are a group, if, if, they, if they are free of virus, are likely to be recommended to continue with treatment of some form. It may not be as intensive as uh, we perhaps would have done uh, without COVID-19 um, uh, restricting services. But nonetheless, we've modified the plans so patients can receive um, highly effective but less intensive therapy uh, should that be required for, for, for example, for acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia will uh, who are newly diagnosed will have their treatment um, as they would have done without the COVID um, uh, pandemic. Patients who have uh, achieved a remission will um, perhaps be delayed. And for those patients to monitor for relapse, bone marrows, blood tests, and other things are continuing. We're trying to rationalize the, uh, the attendances to hospitals. So for example, sometimes scans are delayed or, or put back, but, but other tests are generally being uh, undertaken. If a bone marrow can't be taken, then, then uh, a, a different surrogate marker, perhaps in the peripheral blood is being used instead. Um, patients post-transplant similarly will have routine assessments uh, carried out um, in most centers. The, the frequency of face-to-face -face contacts will reduce, uh, perhaps being replaced with um, telephone contacts. Thank you for that. Um, there's a couple of people asking questions about um, the surprise that they're getting the letter. And I think Kate covered this nicely uh, in the if you are getting letters, uh, say you're 10 years in remission or you, you have some reason to suspect you're not as at high risk based on what Ahmed has explained to us. I think the best advice is to think carefully about is there anything, any reason, any other reason other than your leukemia? as to why you may have received a letter in the first instance. And then the second instance would be to contact your clinical team to ask them for advice as to why uh, you might have received a letter. I think, as I said in the beginning, NHS England have taken a cautious approach with this in that they have, uh, and the coding that is used to generate the letters is, it isn't always accurate. So therefore, people who may not need a letter may have received them. Um, so yes, have a, have, a, have a think before you make a decision as to whether to shield or not, have a think as to whether you might be at risk based on some of the extra information we've managed to provide today um, and speak to your clinical team before you make a decision on that. Um, either, of, uh, either of you, Kate or Amit, want to add anything, uh, add anything to that? No, no I think you covered it there, Charlotte. I think um, 
you're right I mean I was surprised like I said but I think I am you know on reflection yeah I think it's the right thing for me to be doing um not only for myself like you said but for other people as well and you know trying not to put any more burden if I was to get it and need hospital care onto the NHS so yeah I would I would suggest people who have the letter yeah to, to seriously think think about it and yeah do the best that they they feel is right for them great thank you um question for for you Ahmed there's a, a lady here asking um if stem cell transplants are delayed um whether there'll be a backlog of patients and who may or may not be prioritized for transplants in the future is that something we're anticipating to see and how will that be dealt with by clinicians yeah we are worried about this as well um because none of us really know how long the restrictions will be required for. Um, 12 weeks, I think, is likely to be um, conservatively uh, short. It may be longer. Um, and as you say, when when normal um, services are reinitiated at some point, then there will, there will potentially be lots of patients needing treatment. Now, um, the guidance is that uh, we should be prioritizing patients based on their cancer indication. And um, therefore patients who have the highest risk of relapse uh, or the um, uh, those patients that have more of an acute illness, so patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, acute lymphoid leukemia will be prioritized um, uh, at the, the highest um, priority level. In terms of um, if centers don't have capacity after uh, uh, the pandemic is, is gone, then there, there will be regional approaches taken. So patients may be offered treatment um, in you know, their neighboring transplant center or their neighboring CAR T cell therapy center. So that, that, that work is um, already beginning, but that hasn't, that hasn't um, come online yet because we don't know when we'll be able to, um, to initiate normal transplant practice. Thank you for, for that. Um, the last couple of questions, there's a, there's a few people asking um, about the risk to patients once uh, the shielding guidance has ended or whether this might be extended. I don't know if you are able to comment on this, Armit. Um, from our perspective, um, that it's, it's such an unknown at the moment as to how long this may or may not go on for. And um, unfortunately, it, it, there, there is no guidance as to, to what happens once the shielding and the social distancing for everyone else has lifted. But I don't know whether you are able to say anything about the risk um, it from a, a clinical perspective. I, I'd agree with that, Charlotte. I think we just don't know um, what, what the government advice will be. And I think um, if, if we look in at other countries uh, in the Far East where this has occurred, they've had to reinitiate some form of um, self-isolation or restriction in, in, in uh, movement uh, because of a resurgence of the virus. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, we may end up in a similar situation. Um, in terms of self, uh, in ter that's in terms of self-isolation. In terms of shielding, um, it may be that if uh, there is a second wave, then um, the government uh, may choose to advise that shielding is uh, reinitiated for a period. But I think, you know, I can't speculate about that. And I don't think really anybody knows at this stage. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the one last question I wanted to ask is, um, we focus quite heavily on transplants, but there's a question here about uh, how long in remission from other types of treatments, such as chemotherapy, should someone be before you could consider them not at risk in terms of needing to shield or not? So um, for, uh, for acute myeloid leukaemia, if somebody has finished all treatment uh, more than a year ago, is not requiring any further uh, monitoring bone marrows or anything else um, and uh, you know maybe attending every year um, with a blood count then th those patients would be at the lowest risk and those patients um, don't necessarily need to be uh, shielding everybody else should be shielding um, so a couple of examples um, patients who have had their treatment finished five or more years ago 
complete recovery of their blood count, stopped on any further treatment, um, haven't had a bone marrow um, in the last year, and, and there are no further marrows planned, then um, the, the, the advice would be actually, you probably don't need to shield. Um, if somebody has um, finished their treatment um, in a shorter time period, um, or continues to have bone marrow monitoring like uh, Kate mentioned, then really that's part of active treatment and, and you should really be considering yourself as somebody who would benefit from shielding. Um, for acute lymphoblastic leukemia is the same. So if, you've, if you're still on maintenance treatment two or three years out, then you are on active treatment and should be shielding. If you've completed that uh, more than a year ago, but are still having uh, bone marrows for monitoring purposes, then that should be considered as active treatment uh, and should be shielding. If your blood count has not recovered for any reason, you should be shielding. And really only if uh, you're a couple of years out, you're not really being monitored other than the uh, an annual blood count um, and your blood count has recovered, should you then consider yourself uh, somebody who doesn't necessarily have to shield. But I, I think as both Kate and uh, Charlotte have mentioned, um, it's, you know, if there's any doubt at all, uh, it will be, it'll be worth just getting in touch with your, your local um, leukemia service or transplant or CAR T service uh, to clarify the situation because they'll know, they'll know your, about your care better than anybody else. Definitely. Well, I have to apologize to everyone whose questions I haven't got to. Um, I think most of the questions we have answered throughout the presentations as well as during the question section, hence why I focused on some of the things we didn't cover in the presentations. Um, we will be putting this out in some form um, afterwards so people can refer to, uh, to back, back to it. So um, please do that. Or um, I have just put up this slide to make it clear that we at Leukemia Care are still uh, here and providing as many services as we can. And um, you are always more than welcome to drop us an email or give us a call on the helpline and, and we will um, try to advise on your individual circumstances as much as we can. Um, bearing in mind, of course, like always, we can't give individual medical advice and your clinical team are always the best people to, to ask in that uh, instance. Um, I think the only thing left to say is to thank my fellow panellists. Dr. Patel and Kate, thank you so much for your time. I apologise we've taken up slightly more of it than we anticipated, um, but possibly not unexpected. Um, yeah, very grateful for that. Um, and thank you everyone for, for joining us on Facebook and on Zoom. Um, it's been really uh, quite an interesting experience for our first one. Um, in case anybody's watching on Facebook and is wondering about other leukemia types, we have a CLL one at 3 p.m. this afternoon. Um, and we're also working as hard as we can to provide information for every other blood cancer type that, that we can. Um, so please look out for those and we'll distribute the information in newsletters and on social media when those are sorted. Thank you to panelists and thank you for watching everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.